Perhaps you've heard it said that devotion to Mary really was kind of an invention of the medieval church. And, and really, we don't get dogmatic statements until the 19th and even 20th century. And so this is much more of a, quote, Roman invention than it is authentic Christianity. Uh, this position would be a absence of both uh, history and of revelation. And we're going to examine devotion to Mary within the first three to four centuries of the church, uh, what is commonly called the patristic era. What we're going to see is that there is clear doctrine and devotion established to the mother of Jesus in this patristic period. Uh, let's start with the most sacred place that the early Christians had, which would be the catacombs. Uh, remember, the catacombs were oftentimes a place of protection during Christian persecution, and certainly oftentimes a place of worship, where the holy sacrifice of the Mass was offered, as well as uh, various uh, sacraments. So, you're talking about a very sacred place, and a place that would be revered uh, by the early church. And I say this in the sense that you're not simply talking about, you know, graffiti that would be put up on the walls of the catacombs or, or within the, the confines of the catacombs. You're talking about expressions of sacred art or, or, or significant meaning that would be represented in this special Christian place we call the catacombs. So, going to the catacombs, by the end of the first century to the beginning, the first half of the second century, we have depictions of Our Lady, uh, and those would continue on uh, for those first and second centuries, uh, typically dated. What kind of images do we have of the mother of Jesus? First of all, we have Mary at the Annunciation scene. We have the Adoration of the Magi, where our Blessed Virgin has the infant Jesus in her arms, and the, and the Magi are there in adoration, as well as St. Joseph. We also have uh, some very significant images of Our Lady in the catacombs. For example, in the catacombs of St. Agnes, we have an image of Our Blessed Mother in between Peter and Paul. So her arms are outstretched, and in one arm she has Peter, and in the other arm she has Paul. Now, Peter and Paul are always the symbol of the apostolic church. And so, in the language of icon, you have, in, probably in the second century, at the latest the third century, you have an icon of what Blessed Paul VI declares at the Second Vatican Council, that Mary is indeed mother of the church. Uh, the central position of Mary between Peter and Paul speaks for itself. And certainly the, the maternal dimension is already in existence at this time, as we'll see. You also have the image of Mary on the gravestones, which would indicate uh, her intercession for the dead. Clearly, in the first and second centuries, uh, we have uh, the, the early church praying to martyrs, and of course, they're going to pray to Our Lady as the Queen of Martyrs. You also have Mary depicted in interesting positions. For example, within the naves in which the Mass was offered, on the top of those naves, you would have images of our Blessed Mother. Those are typically seen as images of protection. So, just in light of the images of Mary as we see in the catacombs within these first three centuries, uh, what do we see? We have Mary as intercessor. We have her as mother of Jesus. We have her, again, in the presence of the, uh, the adoration of the Magi. There's another very beautiful image of Mary as the Orons, the woman of prayer. And we have Mary depicted in places which would indicate protection and defense uh, over the naves of where the sacraments would be offered, particularly the Mass. Putting this together, you've got a very strong image of Our Lady as mother, intercessor, and of course, mother of Jesus. Along with these images, we have what is acknowledged as the first theological concept of Our Lady. Now, my friends, it's rather remarkable that in this first 
theological image or concept of Mary, we have almost all other dogmas and doctrines regarding Our Lady contained in this first image that the earliest fathers of the church referred to. And I'm referring to the image of Mary as the new Eve. Simply put, that as Eve was secondary, though instrumental, with and under Adam in the loss of grace for the human race, that Mary became the new Eve, that Mary was secondary, though instrumental, with and under Jesus Christ, the new Adam, in the restoration of grace for the human family. So Mary was called the new Eve, the new mother of the living. Uh, now, where does this begin? Well, first, uh, the first extended, uh, re really the first seed of the treatment is, is Justin the martyr, who dies in 165. So you're talking about the middle of the second century, where Justin starts comparing Mary, the obedient virgin, in contrast to Eve, the disobedient virgin. We call that antithetical parallelism. Uh, a parallel, but with an opposite goal and meaning. So, Eve and Mary are given this antithetical uh, parallel, uh, and what is started with Justin Martyr is certainly developed by he who is typically considered the first Mariologist, and that would be St. Irenaeus of Lyon. Uh, he dies in 202. So again, please keep in mind how early this is. We're now talking about the second half of the second century with St. Irenaeus. And I, I want to read to you uh, the expression of St. Irenaeus. This is Irenaeus Against the Heresies, uh, Book 3. Uh, and this parallel is so profound, but, but listen to an added insight he gives about Mary. We'll, we'll draw it out a little bit. St. Irenaeus says, and I quote, Just as Eve, wife of Adam, yet still a virgin, became by her disobedience the cause of death for herself and the whole human race, so Mary, too, espoused yet a virgin, became by her obedience the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. Now let's focus in on that second line. I'm going to say for a third time. This is only the second century. This is second century Mariology. What does Irenaeus say? He says, Mary, by her obedience, became the, quote, cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. Now, that's an extraordinary statement. In fact, if uh, you said that on the radio, which I've done uh, several times, you typically will get some response. A caller said, well, what do you mean Mary is the cause of salvation for herself and the, and the whole human race? And, and where did you invent that? No, this is second century Christian Mariology. Uh, what does he mean? Well, we make our distinctions. He doesn't mean, uh, using more uh, later Thomistic terms, right? He doesn't mean, later developed Thomistic terms, he doesn't mean that Mary is the formal cause of our salvation. That, of course, is Jesus Christ. But he does mean that Mary is a key instrumental secondary cause for our salvation. Why? Because Mary says yes. Back to Mother Teresa. No Mary, no Jesus. Mary says yes, we get our Savior. And at this point in patristic thought, the focus is more on the incarnation. Uh, we'll see by the 5th and 6th century, where you start talking about Mary as uh, the cause of redemption, going on to the 7th and 8th century as well with some authors, that we go from the Annunciation, from the Incarnation, to Mary's role at Calvary. But here, the focus of the earliest fathers are on Mary's role in the Incarnation, which is an event of salvation, right? So, Irenaeus says again, Mary is the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. This is remarkable because, indeed, he's talking about Mary in her co-redemptive function, right? In her assisting Jesus in the, in the plan of the Father, which is the plan of redemption. She does this by her yes, and as we'll see, by her continued yes in the mission of Jesus, which will bring her too to Calvary. But notice also what Irenaeus says when he, when he differentiates 
Mary from the human race. He says, Mary is the cause of salvation for herself and the whole human race. Why would St. Irenaeus single Mary out? Uh, he knows that Mary is a member of the human race. And uh, we're not going to be able to answer that. We can't read his mind. God willing, if we make it uh, to heaven, we can ask him directly. But it seems to be at least some understanding of what the fathers were also saying at this time or shortly after, within the third century, that Mary is entirely without stain, the quote of St. Ambrose. Mary is purer than the angels. Mary, as St. Ephraim would say, Mary is like Eve before the fall of Eve. These are all references to what we now call the Immaculate Conception. And when you say by the 4th or 5th century, she's sine macula, which means without stain, or as St. Ambrose said, altogether without sin, that's immaculate. But again, going back to Irenaeus, why the singling out? Could it be that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Irenaeus had some sense of saying, I'm going to talk about Mary being the cause of salvation for herself in, in one note, and then in the next note, the whole human race. How much did he understand of this? We simply don't know, but he says it. Later, we'll come to understand and we'll discuss that when Jesus redeems the world, he first redeems his mother in what we know to be preservative redemption, uh, thanks to the genius of Blessed Dun Scotus. So that Mary may participate with Jesus in the redemption of the world, Redeemer and co-redemptrix at Calvary, uh, the redemptive, the, the anticipatory salvation of Mary makes her the perfect partner with Jesus as the new Eve with the new Adam in redemption. It, it, it's a beautiful thing, my friends, that God the Father wanted to show his omnipotence by saying, okay, you lost grace by a man, by a woman, by a tree. So, I'm going to show that indeed I am all-powerful, even though I'm always respective of freedom. And we're going to redeem the world. We're going to save the world. We're going to restore the world with a man, with a woman, and with a tree. With Jesus, the new Adam, Mary, the new Eve, and the tree of the cross. It's a beautiful concept of both recapitulation, recirculation, as the fathers talk about it. So, extraordinary insight by Irenaeus. Now, St. Jerome, always pithy and to the point, summarizes this whole uh, profound understanding of Mary as the new Eve when he says, quote, death through Eve, life through Mary. Death through Eve, life through Mary. That's all secondary causality, but it's still true. Uh, and that's why within the first three centuries, the Christian a community, the church clearly understood that Mary had this, this accentuated role with Jesus, the new Adam, in saving the world. No medieval invention, no later dogmatic statements. It's there from the beginning. And it's articulated, and it's visualized, uh, and it's preached, and it's taught. Mary has this special role with Jesus in the work of salvation. We'll later see when we see the history of co-redemption that uh, the Akathist uh, hymn, the, the Eastern hymn, talks about uh, the lutrosis, the, the, the redemption accomplished by Mary, of course, in service of Jesus and always dependent on Jesus. Uh, but this is, this is so early and it's clear that from the beginning, from the Christian get-go, they understand the role of Mary, second subordinate but unique to all other members in the mystical body. Now, we have the catacombs, the images of Our Lady. We have this theological concept of the new Eve, in which, by the way, we can draw the Immaculate Conception, uh, Eve being identical, I should say Mary being identical to Eve before the fall of Eve. We can see clearly her spiritual motherhood, right? Mary's the new mother of the living, not in the order of nature, but in the order of grace. New Eve anticipates Lumen Gentium 61. Uh, Mary is, a, quote, a mother to us in the order of grace. 
Uh, we can see clearly in that statement Mary's role as co-redemptrix. She's the cause of salvation uh, for herself and the whole human race. That's why the simplest way of explaining co-redemptrix is simply saying Mary helped Jesus save souls like no one else. That's not a tough one. That's not a, that's not a difficult doctrine to understand and to assent to. What about direct prayer to Mary? Also, uh, by the 2nd, 3rd, 4th centuries, there's clear evidence and indication that the Christian body, the church, is praying to Mary. And praying to Mary directly and praying to Mary for the critical protection during times of persecution. For example, St. Irenaeus actually refers to Mary as an advocate for Eve. So, the new mother of the living has to intercede for the salvation of the old mother of the living because she went astray by her cooperation in original sin. Uh, St. Gregory uh, Thaumatergus, St. Ephraim, uh, St. Gregory Nancyanson all refer to direct prayer to Mary. And I think perhaps the best example is what is sometimes called the most complete ancient prayer to Our Lady, which is called the Subtum Presidium, which literally means under your protection. Some people will be familiar with this because it, it, at least traditionally, was recited at the beginning or at the end of the Litany of Loretto, Our Lady's Litany. Let's go through a Latinized version of the Subtum and, and look at the level of development by the early Christian community of confidence in our mother. Uh, the Subtum, we fly to your patronage, O Holy Mother of God, despise not our petitions and our necessities, but deliver us from all danger, O ever glorious and blessed Virgin. Okay. Dated around 250 AD, first thing we have to observe is that they're referring to Mary as Mother of God in the, in, in the third century. That wouldn't be defined until the Council of Ephesus in 431. That reminds us that a doctrine can be a doctrine and completely true even before it's solemnly defined as a dogma. The early Christians surely and clearly called Mary Mother of God. So we'll talk about what the dogma. It's not talking about Mary as Mother of the Father, Mother of the Holy Spirit. Those would be blasphemy and heresy. Mother of God the Son made man. And the early Christians got it and prayed to Mary as Mother of God. Secondly, they're asking for her intercession directly. It's a direct prayer to Mary. It's not like saying, Jesus, please ask your mother to intercede for us. It's, it's directly to Mary. Why is that such a big deal? Because today, sadly, many Christians uh, think that praying directly to Mary is some type of act of idolatry. And we're going to clarify in our next lecture the distinctions between latria, dulia, and what is called hyperdulia, but for now, remember, prayer is not necessarily a form of adoration. Prayer is spiritual communication to someone in the mystical body for the sake of intercession. And so when we pray to Mary, that's not the same as giving adoration to Mary. Uh, again, distinctions we will make. And again, it is simply indisputable that the early Christian church prayed directly to Mary. So how odd it is that as we're supposed to develop over the years of our Christian faith that we have Christians now not doing what the early Christians were doing. Uh, that would be a mistake, and that's why we want to uh, adjust our understanding of Christianity to what the early church was doing and has done without fail. Thirdly, they're praying to Mary at a time of persecution. That means they understand that Mary's intercession is not just a lightweight matter. It's not just a superficiality. Uh, it's who you go to when you're praying for your life. Uh, C.S. Lewis used to quip that when you have a, a toothache, there's only two people that really matter, yourself and the dentist. Well, in a real sense, it shows that at times of pain or, or difficulty or, or crisis, you go to people you trust. The early church went to Mary at times of crisis. And again, and, and, and let me, uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit uh, haunted by the words of St. Maximin Kolbe, who says, every time you speak about Mary, you don't always have to say, yes, but Mary is subordinate to Jesus. Yes, but Mary is a creature and Jesus is God. Uh, that's not necessary to constantly be doing. 
And, and that's, that's fair to say. Uh, and, I, and I'm not going to do it constantly, but, but let's recall that when the early Christians are praying to Mary, this is no competition to Jesus. This pleases Jesus because they're responding to that which Jesus himself established as their mother. Ecce mater tua, behold your mother. So we have that complete prayer to Mary. By the Council of Ephesus in 431, as both theologians and historians will say, devotion to Our Lady just exploded in both the East and the West. At the Council of Ephesus, as we'll discuss in a future lecture shortly, Mary is proclaimed to be the Theotokos, the Mother of God. This devotion is extraordinary. Some say that it cannot be documented in its full specificity. What are we talking about? We're talking about Marian liturgies, uh, which means a Marian feast, like the Feast of the Annunciation or the Feast of the Mother of God, Marian feast days, we're not obviously talking about the Mass being offered to Mary. Uh, there was a 4th century sect who did that. Uh, they were a group of female priests, and that was already a little indication of being off-kilter in terms of authentic Catholic doctrine and practice. No, we're talking about feasts dedicated to our Blessed Mother. Marian architecture, churches named after the Mother of God. In fact, we'll find that with the Council of Ephesus, uh, the council was actually conducted within a church already called the Theotokos. Marian poetry. We have St. Ephraim, uh, the harp of the Holy Spirit, the great Syrian deacon. Uh, we have the great explosion of icons, the, the great you know, promulgation of, of iconic images of Our Lady. In most every Marian literature, in most every dimension of authentic Christian culture, you have the presence of Mary after Ephesus. This is how Lumen Gentium uh, describes this. This is Lumen Gentium number 56. Rightly, therefore, the fathers see Mary not merely as passively engaged by God, but as freely cooperating in the work of man's salvation through faith and obedience. Hence, not a few of the early fathers gladly assert with St. Irenaeus in their preaching, quote, The knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's obedience. What the virgin Eve Bound by her disbelief, Mary loosened by her faith. Comparing Mary with Eve, they call her mother of the living and frequently claim death through Eve, life through Mary. And this, this continuity of devotion is also captured in Lumen Gentium number 66. And I quote, It is confirmed, in, well, th these are the words of the council, From the earliest times, the Blessed Virgin is honored, under the title Mother of God, whose protection the faithful take refuge together in prayer in all their perils and need. Accordingly, following the Council of Ephesus, there was a remarkable growth in the cult of the people of God towards Mary, in veneration and love, in invocation and imitation. According to her own prophetic words, quote, all generations shall call me blessed. So, this explosion of devotion to Our Lady will show itself even with greater development at times of the Middle Ages, but to say it started in the Middle Ages, again, would be an absence or an ignorance of documentable history. Uh, I want to close this segment with a quote by a British historian, a Kenneth Clark, who, who is uh, not a Catholic by any means, but this is his understanding of the role of devotion to Our Lady as it continues forward. He said, referring to devotion to Mary, he describes her as, quote, the supreme protectress of civilization. She had taught a race of tough and ruthless barbarians the virtues of tenderness and compassion. The great cathedrals of the Middle Ages were her dwelling places upon earth. In the Renaissance, while remaining the queen of heaven, she became also the human mother in whom everyone could recognize qualities of warmth and love and approachability. Uh, in the words of Dante uh, from the Paradiso, he says, quote, With living mortals you are a living spring of hope. Lady, you are so great and have such worth that if anyone seeks out grace and flies not to thee, his longing is like flight without wings. So, the rich devotion, which we do see in the Middle Ages to Our Lady, didn't start there. 
There's this beautiful development of doctrine based on the doctrinal seeds and the living reality of Mary in the apostolic church as it continues under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Not new seeds, but a greater appreciation of what is already there, a greater understanding and living out of apostolic tradition and that which was present in the first three centuries of the church. We'll now move on to a discussion about an authentic distinction regarding Latria, worship particular to God, Dulia, that among the saints in general, and Hyperdulia, that which is unique to the Blessed Virgin. Thank you.